Folks, thanks for uh, having me back to PodCamp. Uh, it's been a while since I was at PodCamp Pittsburgh because I left Pittsburgh for Baltimore back in 2009. It wasn't you, it was me. It was what I was going through. Um, but it's interesting to come back here because I was at the icebreaker yesterday speaking with some folks actually from uh, Liberated Syndication, and they were like, oh, so what do you do? And I realized I've been gone for so long that nobody knows me anymore, so I have to reestablish why I'm even in front of you. Uh, so welcome to PodCamp. Welcome to the uh, 10th PodCamp Pittsburgh. We started this back in 2006 because there was a group of people in Boston who did the original PodCamp. Uh, and the original PodCamp concept was if you produce internet media, and when you think of a podcast nine years ago, that was mainly audio, a little bit of video, you were making this on your own you know, uh, out of the love of your own heart, your own blood, sweat, and tears, and money, and putting this on the internet and seeing who would listen to it. Could you develop an audience? Could you find like-minded peers? And it was difficult nine years ago for these people who were making this media to get face-to-face -face with each other, because there were so few of them. So in Boston, uh, two gentlemen, Chris Brogan and Christopher Penn, came up with the idea to have this thing called PodCamp, where the people who were creating the media would come together and peer educate each other on how they do what they do and why, what's working, what's not. So it sort of became this um, uh, you know, DIY crash course on how to make media. And it caught on in a really interesting way. They thought it would just be Bostonians arriving at that first one. And it turns out there were 300 people from all around the country that showed up. Folks came down from Vancouver, they came over from London. So PodCamp became more than just a local thing right off the bat. And at the end of it, they said, you know what we should do is if you, who are at this event, want to take this concept back to your city and do it where you live and make your own community around this, go for it. But it's got to always be free. You can add a VIP element if you'd like to. But it's got to be free. There has to be a way that anybody off the street can walk in and learn. And the other thing is, it's always got to be peer education. This can't be a case where you have professional speakers coming in, charging exorbitant fees, uh, and you have this, this pre-established class schedule. So if you may have noticed, there was an open call for sessions for PodCamp because anybody can get up and teach. And if there are open rooms, you can teach a breakout session in one. So it's always about what do you know at that moment that you can share that's useful to others. So it's, it's very grassrootsy in a certain way. And there's a reason that a lot of podcasts started after Boston. This was the first non-Boston podcast. We're like the second ever podcast, and we're still going. And there's a few others out there, but very few, because we all quickly realized there's money to be made in this as well. So it became more than just a kumbaya thing of we creators getting together and teaching each other. It became, well, how can we turn this into a professional business? And my keynote is going to touch on some of these things because I think um, some of the things that we predicted that might happen nine years ago have happened. Some haven't gone quite the way we thought they might. And some have come out of nowhere and changed how internet media is made and consumed. So that puts us in an interesting situation right now where how many of you in this room make media and share it online? That's most of you. Out of curiosity, how many of you don't? Do you want to learn? Is this why you're here? Yes. Okay. If you don't want to learn and you don't make media, did you just want the free coffee? <laughs> okay. Is the Keurig working? All right. Um, so without further ado, I'm going to try and run through this as quickly as I can because um, I was unable to get this under 45 minutes before when I was practicing it, and then I added more things this morning because I'm an egomaniac or an asshole, I can't tell, one of the two. So let's see how fast we can get through this, right? So we've been around for a while, we've had a lot of things happening at PodCamp, we've had a lot, I mean these are the faces of some of the folks who've been here for years, uh, including down there on the bottom, our beloved Mayor Bill Peduto, who once came here as city councilman and wound up getting elected. So I like to think... <laughs> If you're looking for ripple effects of PodCamp, we have a nice touch there. But there was the original logo for PodCamp back in November of 2006, and you might notice that that is the downtown skyline with uh, the fountain sprouting out of an iPod. So if you want to think about how much has changed since then, that was how we consumed media nine years ago. That was our mobile device. Things are a little bit different now. Uh, now we're just sad, lonely people in a room. <laughs> and the reason that we come out to events like PodCamp is because we want to be sad, lonely people in a room together, <laughs> staring at our phones and ignoring each other. But really, the question is, why do we sit in these sad, lonely rooms and make media? What's the point? You could be doing anything with your free time, so why 
of all things, would you go online and try and create something and pour your heart and soul into it only to attract clickbait ads and trolls, right? Well, that's really not why we do it. We do it for community. At the heart of why we create media is so that we don't have to be alone. We do it so we can entertain, we do it so we can educate, we do it so we can enlighten. So these are three different things that happen when you're making a piece of media. You're either sharing the knowledge that you've got, you're trying to excite or inspire someone, or you're trying to reach them on a more humane level. So in other words, we do it for ourselves, for our own good, to be heard, to be understood, and to connect with other people. And I could have another slide up here that says we do it for reach, respect, reputation, and revenue, which are all nice words, but you don't get those unless you're getting this part right, because those are the after effects of you connecting with an audience. Nobody likes what you likes on Facebook, what you're doing, nobody shares, nobody follows, unless you reach them on either an intellectual or an emotional level. And the folks who jump into this hoping that it's either going to be a quick buck, or who jump into it because they're just desperate for attention, uh, have some difficulties in connecting with people sometimes because they're not delivering anything in the end that is useful or meaningful. They're not creating a connection that somebody else wants to voluntarily sustain. The other issue that we have right now is that this whole concept of community is starting to fade out for a couple reasons. And I'm going to get into those right now because we've got uh, four trends. Four? I was a little tired when I made this slide. It might be three trends. We'll see what happens. But there's some trends and a challenge coming up here. And the, the point of this is, again, when I was thinking what's changed since 2006, I was thinking what are the big differences that either we were predicting would happen that did come true and we were right about, or the things that came out of left field that we couldn't have possibly seen. The one, uh, hey, look, it is three trends. Awesome. So I just saved us like 10 minutes. That's great. Um, <laughs> But it's the rise of mobile, it's the rise of you, the personal brand, and it's the collapse of distribution options. That last one sounds like kind of tech wonky, like it's not as cool and interesting as the first two, but it's actually really interesting and we're going to spend the most time on it, so get ready. Uh, first though, the rise of mobile. I don't have to explain this to you because you all probably signed up for this on a mobile device uh, and you're probably all staring at one right now and ignoring me, so thanks. But, uh, there is an interesting uh, annual report done by Mary Meeker from uh, Klein and Perkin. Uh, whoops, oh god, I broke that. Um, thanks, that was podcast. Good, good, good. Um, no, so every year she puts together this list of uh, internet trends, and this sort of becomes like the industry standard of what is popular and meaningful in digital media and technology. And this was a slide that I literally ripped out of her presentation because I was in a rush. And it sums everything up, I think, incredibly well. I want to point something out to you. So you've got these three bars. There's this little yellow one down here, and that is uh, other connected devices. So your Xboxes, Blackberries, and things that we don't actually list in most data reports. Then there's desktop and laptop. Uh, that's how much time we're spending on these things every day. You know what's interesting is that time hasn't changed. If you go back to 2008, we're spending a little over two hours, maybe under three, on desktop and laptop devices. We haven't curtailed that in any way. But look what's grown. Less than half an hour in 2008 is what we were spending on mobile devices. Now we're nearly at three hours every day on our mobile devices. Well, there's only 24 hours in a day, so if that hasn't changed, and the amount of work that we're doing on the other digital devices hasn't changed, and there's another slide in her presentation that talks about TV, that hasn't changed either. We're still watching the same amount of TV. So what's different? What are we not doing? Part of it is we're not paying as much attention to print media anymore. I mean, newspapers and magazines have nosedived. But the other thing we're paying less attention to is each other and the people around us. We're spending a lot less time in person with other human beings, and we're spending a lot more time on Tinder trying to find human beings we can spend less time with. So it's been an interesting time shift for us and an attention shift for us. So the first thing you have to think about when you're making media is it's going to be viewed on a mobile device much more often and much uh, more prevalently than on anything else. So if it doesn't look good on a phone, and if it doesn't reach people on a phone, and how do you reach people on a phone? Literally, you don't even call people on a phone anymore. They don't answer. So how do you reach people on a phone? Well, apparently you do it by talking about yourself endlessly. Um, we, not, not I personally, but the social media gurus of the world coined the phrase um, personal branding a few years ago as though your purpose for being online is to present yourself as a product or service, right? So when you go online, you have a persona. 
and you must always be burnishing this persona at all times. You know what your value proposition is for the people around you, and as a result, you want them to like you and love you and share you. So you very uh, specifically cultivate this image of yourself. And is it narcissistic? Yes, absolutely. Is it useful? Potentially, depending on what your end goal is. But you have things like the rise of selfies, which a certain generation absolutely deplores, and younger generations see as a perfectly natural self-expression to the extent that like, that's literally all you see on some Instagram accounts is just selfie after selfie. We're inventing this uh, fictionalized version of who we are at all times. I mean, we're doing it right now face to face. But when you're online, you can take the time to perfectly edit that photo of that brunch you had. And you can solicit those 25 likes on Instagram. And that makes you feel like you had a worthwhile morning. And what's interesting is while you're doing that, you're not paying attention not only to the person sitting across the table from you, but you're not paying attention to anything else in that little screen. What you're paying attention to is you. So we've spent more time on mobile devices and more time on ourselves over the past 10 years. Where does that leave those of us who want to make media that actually reaches other people? Well, uh, it's interesting because in a certain way, it almost doesn't matter to a, a large subset of the population. There's a new startup coming out called Paper Row, which I was reading about, and I pull quoted this off Medium. Uh, for Generation Z, looking at an article that they can't actively comment on and be a part of while they're reading it, or watching a video that they can't make live comments about on Periscope, doesn't interest them. They are part of the media experience. When you make media, you're inviting them to add their media to it. And if there's no space for them, they don't want to be a part of just listening to you, Dad. You know, like what they really want is for you to validate their attention. So it's an interesting world that we're living in right now, where it's not enough to just make something. You've got to make it and then lure people in so they can see themselves in that media. The last part of this is uh, the collapse of distribution. And this is like a fun slide. Look, there's pastel colors and ice cream. We all love it. But it's all pointing towards a doom point there in the middle. And I want you guys to remember this image because it's going to pop up again uh, in a couple more slides. But once upon a time, like nine years ago when we started PodCamp, the question was literally, when you're making media, where does it go? Where do you put it on the internet? How do you get people to watch it? Like These are all the questions that we had. Well, nine years later, we have an answer. And I don't know that all of us in this room would have predicted the answer or that we necessarily like the answer, but it's the reality that we live in. And I think if you're making media in this space, in this time, you have to know what this reality is. You have to know what your odds of connecting with other human beings are. So here's how we do it. 2006, there was this awesome thing called MySpace. Oh my god, it was so cool. Oh. Notice how those heads look like headstones. That was, this is what happened to MySpace. But, so in 2006, MySpace was the bomb to the extent that right before the very first podcast, they announced they had 100 million members. Oh man, what a milestone. 100 million people using the same service online. This was mind-boggling to the internet pundits at the time. They were like, how is this even possible, right? Mashable, when they wrote about this, actually, they wanted to, to curtail the, the enthusiasm of it. They said, MySpace appears to be number one. But if you look at the numbers, Yahoo is still number one. MySpace is number two. So just for those of you who wonder if time ever changes anything, there was a time in America where MySpace and Yahoo were the two places we spent most of our time. <laughs> now we avoid them like the plague, to the extent that MySpace was proud to announce they'd rebounded to 36 million members by 2013, after the uh, news corporation cratering of that company. So MySpace went the way of the dodo. I don't know any of these 36 million members, by the way. Are any of you on MySpace? I heard laughter. Look at that. What your vision. <laughs> All right, so MySpace was once upon a time the top dog. If you wanted to be seen and heard, that was where you went. What happened? What, what is the uh, disruptive upstart company that changed things? Facebook. So in 2007, people started noticing that MySpace was losing ground to Facebook. And all those, these numbers on the left-hand side are much larger than what Facebook was seeing in 2007. Notice that all of the trends are red from MySpace. It's going downhill, and it's starting to go downhill quickly whereas Facebook is starting to ramp up. How fast are they ramping up? Well, this was August of 2007. It only went up from there, because that dark blue line you see arcing toward the top right of your, of your uh, screen there, that's MySpace's meteoric rise over the next year. Right, the, uh, sorry, that's a, yeah, oh god. Did I say MySpace's rise? Yeah, sorry. No. Uh, MySpace tanks. MySpace is the uh, sad line that is uh, tailing up at the end. Facebook is rising, and so is Blogger. 
which is interesting. So is uh, WordPress. Self-expression platforms are coming up. MySpace and its terrible design elements are tanking. But, so you start to think, oh, look at this. Facebook is, is uh, beating out MySpace near the end of 2008. It has 150 million users. That's crazy. It's almost double what MySpace was at its peak. Well, it gets bigger because in 2008, we're, we're way down here. This is where MySpace was at its peak. That's a rounding error. Facebook owns the internet right now to the extent that it's got a billion and a half users every month. Worldwide, active users, and it's still growing. That's plus 10% over last year. Facebook somehow is miraculously finding people who don't already have a Facebook account and they're signing them up. It's, it, it's all in Africa, is my guess, or other places that uh, the internet is just now starting to penetrate and make into an ecosystem. Because 136,000 photos are being uploaded every minute. Is that a lot? Well, it means 300 million photos are uploaded every day. You're not going to take that many photos in your lifetime. Those of us in this room aren't going to take 136,000 photos in our lifetime. That's a lifetime's worth of photos being uploaded every minute. This is how much content is being put on Facebook. And this is what's fighting for your attention as you're making media online. 4.75 billion pieces of content shared daily. But here's the scariest part, I think. One in five of every web page views is Facebook. 20% of all internet communication is happening on Facebook. Facebook owns it in such a way that it was inconceivable 10 years ago. You have Facebook and everyone else. And if you didn't believe that, here's how we share. 82% of what you find out about right now happens on Facebook, with Twitter a paltry second place at 8.6%. Add those together, and that's 90% of all of your inputs are Facebook and Twitter. I know for a fact, I open up four tabs when I open up my browser. It's Gmail, Facebook, Twitter, and LinkedIn, because I'm a masochist. But that's all the time that I'm spending online. Everything else that I get comes through these channels, which means if you're making media and you're like, well, I'm going to make my own website. I'm not going to play by these rules. It's not going to matter because you're not going to be seen. You've got to go and play in the world that Facebook created for us. Who's doing it really well is BuzzFeed, by the way. These are the media properties that were most shared on Facebook a year ago. And you've got BuzzFeed and Huffington Post. Uh, Huffington Post which doesn't really make most of their own media anyway. But what's interesting is BuzzFeed is way ahead of the curve. And who's down there in the middle of the pack is NBC. But NBC had an idea. Remember those ice cream cones? NBC slash Comcast slash Universal, which is now all the same company, which is an incestuous clusterfuck, let's be honest. The, the distribution platform and the content and the screen on which you watch it and how you access the internet is now all the same company. So don't worry, it's totally diverse and there's many options for uh, independent thought. They just bought huge chunks of Vox and BuzzFeed, $200 million plus each. So if you thought BuzzFeed was going to be the answer and the new media company, uh, old boss steps in once again. So every time you think there's going to be a disruption, the big players take over. The new big players are actually now going head to head. You've got Facebook versus YouTube, and this is going to be the most interesting. If you thought MySpace versus Yahoo was going to be big 10 years ago, wait till this one. Because Facebook now, has changed their algorithm. If you have a YouTube video and you share it on Facebook, it gets shared a lot less than if you uploaded it to Facebook directly. So Facebook has said, you know, YouTube is nice, but it takes traffic away from us. We want that traffic. We want to serve more ads. We want more data. So Facebook is now going head to head with YouTube to become the number one video platform. And if that happens, what other options do we have? So the question 10 years ago, where do you go to get seen? It's Facebook. What do you do? It's Facebook. The answer to every question is Facebook. Do we like this answer? I'm not sure. Is there an alternative? I'm not sure. But it helps to know that this is where we stand. So asks average white man, what does this matter to me? Well, this guy should be aware of the fact that his voice is going to become ever less useful and popular over the next 40 years. But beyond that, why does it matter at all? Like, so this is the reality, this is Facebook. Isn't that, isn't that great? We have a blueprint now. You make the media, you put it on the Facebook, and the people come to the Facebook and they like it, right? That's all we have to do. Well, not exactly. Here's the actual challenge that we face as creators of media. And I would say this, uh, no matter what it is that you're making, we're in this exact same boat. Every media maker is competing with every other media maker out there. It's kind of a given, but if you think about that, what that really means is you and I are in competition with Fox and CNN and Universal and Pixar and every other major media company out there that is putting the same information on a Facebook and trying to get people's attention. 
And if I already know what these other companies are, these other media makers are, why would I stop watching them to watch you? Why would you stop watching them to watch me? So we're fighting not only for the same uh, audience, we're fighting on the same platforms. We said 10 years ago, there's gonna become a time, you know, we used to get um, interesting questions from people who were like, why do you make media for the internet? Do you wanna be on TV someday? And we were like, actually, it's all gonna be the same thing, so it's not gonna matter. Well, we were right about that, but it turns into something of a, a you know, congratulations, I'm sorry moment, because we were right, and now we have to fight amongst the big dogs who are there. Look at the top 10 podcasts right now. This is as of a couple days ago. This American Life, The Mystery Show, Ted Radio Hour, Serial, Radio Lab, we know who these people are, Mark Maron. These are not amateurs, these are not guys in their basement, although Mark Maron's in his garage, but he's in his garage with President Obama. These are not hackers, right? These are hustlers, and these are professionals who have actual media contacts and money to spend. Now, you may be sitting here thinking there's no way I would ever get into the top 10 whatsoever, and I'm about to challenge that notion as well, because it can be done. But it's interesting what gets the job done these days. The other thing I wanted to point out is it, this, it's the same no matter what kind of media you're making. Uh, over the past 10 years, journalism and comedy have revolutionized what we think of as a podcast. Now, look who's uh, the big names in podcasting for just comedy alone. Chris Hardwick, NPR, Mark Maron, Joe Rogan, again, long-time 20-year professionals. The, the ringer here is Grace Helbig, who, yeah, she's basically a new media star. The, the most legacy media she was a part of before this was like G4 and Attack of the Show. So it was already like the tech TV style disruptive media coming at the tail end of what we thought was going to be legacy media's crumble. So she's found a way to rise to the top using her YouTube audience. But everybody else up here are the big boys playing with other people's money. Uh, it's a little different on YouTube though. Because on YouTube, so if you take out, these are the top 10 YouTube channels by subscriber right now. Ignore YouTube Spotlight, because that's a ringer, it's just them. But PewDiePie, Polis Soy German, Smosh, and Jenna Marbles down there at the bottom. These literally are four people just doing stuff, you know, in their free time. PewDiePie is literally a, a man in Sweden talking about video games. And he is the most subscribed human being on the planet on YouTube. So if you sit there and you think, well, it can't be done. The good news is it can be done to the extent that he's actually outperforming the Rihanna's, Katy Perry's, One Direction's, and Eminem's of the world, which is astounding. There's a somewhat sad truth to this, though. Although he may be way ahead of them in terms of subscribers, he's way behind them in terms of what that's doing for him. His 38 million subscribers earned him $7 million last year. And you can sit here and go, well, I'm not going to cry for a guy who made $7 million. And fair enough. But the truth is, if you have a television show on NBC Comcast Universal that was getting 38 million viewers every week, you'd be on the cover of every magazine on the planet. Everybody would know your name, your cast's name, what you had for breakfast. This guy has a very small, hyper-segmented audience compared to everybody else. He's monetized it well, if that's a concern of yours. But I want to point out that getting big on YouTube isn't getting big in the traditional media sense. So that economy still hasn't quite caught up. But it can be done. We can do it. And in fact, uh, I Justine, aka Justine Zarek, aka Pittsburgh's own I Justine, is an example who is, she's gotten herself up to well over two million uh, subscribers on YouTube. She came out of she was online before Podcamp, but she was here with you sitting in these seats a couple years ago, and now she's in Los Angeles doing Entertainment Tonight and other sorts of things. So it can be done. I'm going to circle back to her at the end because. I, there, I, I get doom and gloomy when I'm doing a keynote at 3 o'clock in the morning, which is what I was doing last night, but there's a happy uh, message here at the end that I'm going to get back to. So, yay, we can become someone who uh, is on par with these other creators in the millions of subscribers. Are we connecting with them? Is there any actual meaning happening from that media? Well, I don't know, because again, we're up against all of this. It can be done. You've got to outwit the Walking Deads and Taylor Swifts of the world who are on the same channels. You've also got to fight this other weird battle that came up over the past few years. Here are some of the top stories from Business Insider a couple days ago. New York Jets quarterback incident and a plastic surgery concern from the modern family star. I don't know that either of those is businessy or insidery, but if you know anything about Business Insider, you know that they may have started as a Business Insider production, but all they need right now is page views, and they're not alone. Every single outlet on the web is publishing and pushing the exact same content to bring in the exact same audience. 
to the extent that you have things like this. Now let me read this for a second and let it sink in, partly because if you're over the age of 30, this headline makes no fucking sense anyway. Um, but this is really gossip about the dating lives of two of the One Direction members. Front page on Realty Today. I want to see the Venn diagram of people who are One Direction fans and commercial real estate speculators. I think it's a really small overlap. But Realty Today doesn't care because Realty Today just wants your desperate attention. They don't care if you're a 15 year old living in Israel. They just want you to come and click on their ads. That's what they're really in the business of. Everything else is a ruse. So sadly enough, that's what we're all in the business of. We all have to fight with the Realty Todays and the Business Insiders and the Comcast Universals to get seen. It's a little rough. I like to say content is broken, and I like to say this is the title of the book I'm writing. You can buy it next year. But uh, yeah, content is totally broken, folks. So if you go to justinpanaki.com and join the mailing list or follow me on Twitter, you'll get more updates about this. But it's a thing that I've been ruminating on for the past few years, and a lot of folks have been talking to in the industry feel the same way, but there's sort of a paralysis about it. Everything is content, and all this content is aimed at marketing. And all this marketing is aimed at making money, which is great if you can do it. But what's getting lost in the entire experience is the person-to-person -person interaction. But it can be done. And I'm going to end this with what I'd like to think of as a positive story, but you're going to think it might not be as it starts. So Justine uh, lives out in Los Angeles, a uh, big-time you know, uh, video blogger. And like other video bloggers, they all know each other. And she met an interesting video blogger and wound up making a movie with this girl. Uh, you might think that this is going to be a tale of two girls hitting each other with pillows, but no, uh, it can actually matter more than that. Here's a girl named Lizzie Velasquez, and I'm not sure if any of you have any of you seen Lizzie Velasquez before. Oh, all right, there's some hands. Uh, Lizzie is an interesting story. She has, um, I believe, it's still an undiagnosed condition. But basically, her body has a terrible amount of time uh, holding on to its own resources. So as you can see, she has uh, what some might refer to as a deformity, to the extent that uh, a couple of years ago, when she herself was on the internet, before she was even video blogging, she said she was actually, I think, trying to find a Taylor Swift uh, video on YouTube. And she saw, suggested in the sidebar, a video called World's Ugliest Woman. So she clicked on it, as you do, because we're all morbid people on the internet. And it turns out the world's ugliest woman was her. It was a video clip of her on a talk show from years ago, I think talking about the condition. But all of the comments were things like, her parents should have aborted her. Kill it with fire. Who would let her leave the house? What is wrong with these people? And it was nonstop invective terror aimed at this girl, who they didn't even care if she was going to see it. They didn't know what her name was. They didn't know if she was online. They just wanted to hate something and hate it publicly. And what they were hating was her. So she finds this. And I don't know what you would do in this situation, but she told her parents, because she was looking for some sort of support, and she said she wanted to go and confront all these people. Like she, she knows she has a condition, and she wants them to know it's not OK for them to act like this. And she was really pissed, justifiably. And what her dad said was, you have to forgive them. You have to go to these people who are saying the world's worst things about you, and you have to say, I see where you're coming from. I'm sorry you feel that way, and I need you to see me as a human being. So she started her own video blog where she takes on, not bullies directly, but the act of bullying. And she talks about why if she can get through it, you can get through it. And she, as you can see from her subscriber numbers, is growing very steadily. She has over uh, 400,000. But this uh, TED talk that plays when you get to her page has over 8 million views. So she's resonating with people who see something of their story in her. To the extent that uh, at one point she was a fan of Justine's, and then they happened to connect through YouTube. And eventually, Lizzie got the idea that she wanted to make a movie, a documentary about this entire process. And she asked Justine to executive produce it. So they appeared at South by Southwest this year, and I happened to be in the audience for it. And here's why I think this entire keynote can end on a positive, and I think this is what we can take away from a podcast as you go through it this weekend. Why are we here? We're here for connections. What happened in this discussion is they sat down, they talked about how they do what they do, they were in very good bubbly moods, everything was great, and they opened up the room for questions. And I'm sitting there worried because I have no idea what someone's going to say to either of these people because you never know when there's going to be a live troll in the room. 
So they got some questions from other video bloggers about how do we self-promote, and yada, yada, yada. And then a guy gets up there, I'm gonna ballpark him in his early 40s, not what I would think of as a standard fan of either of their work. And he admitted it. He gets up to the microphone and he says, hey, um, so I'm a journalist, I'm actually here for work, and I would not be in this room right now at all because I've never seen either of your shows, I didn't know who you were until this morning when my daughter found out that the two of you were gonna be in the same room at South by Southwest where her dad happens to be. And she begged and begged and begged me and made me promise that I would come to this session. So I'm here for my daughter and she says hello. And now here's what I wanna say. I wanna say thank you because my daughter is 12 years old and she's a maker. And she's a maker because she found your channels three or four years ago and she was a fan for a while. But then she started thinking to herself, you know what, if they can do that, I can do that. So my daughter is sharing who she is with the world. And she's a storyteller because of you. I think that's why we do this. So you can take your Comcast, NBC Universals, you can take your 38 million subscribers, but the reason that we're here in this room today is to have these kinds of moments happen. You can't control who's gonna see your media or how they're gonna react to it, but that's actually the beauty of it. You never know who you're gonna to touch and if it's gonna be your life or their life that changes. But when you're making media, anything is possible. And two guys thought anything was possible a couple years ago. So they got a community together and created this thing called PodCamp, which we keep alive here in Pittsburgh today. One of them, whose face I was about to eat nine years ago, Chris Grogan, is here to walk us out of the keynote so we can get on with our PodCamp lives. But it wouldn't be PodCamp without Chris. So Chris, if you can join me on the stage here. Ladies and gentlemen, a round of applause for Boston, Chris Grogan. Well, I had a whole other set of thoughts in my head, but I was kind of crying <laughs> because of that last story. So I was like, oh, God, he's going to call me up and I'll be still crying. Uh, I'm an evil marketer and a money maker, and uh, I like money because I like eating a lot. It's quite obvious. Um, when we started PodCamp, it was all about hugs, and it was all about love, and it was all about kumbaya. And what we believed uh, was that we should really connect with people. We can really make people just fall in love with each other. This is going to be the best thing in the world. And a lot of my friends thought we were going to take on all those big guys, and boy, were we going to win. And then a lot of my friends had to go back and find a day job. And a lot of my friends had to put on blue shirts and beige pants and say, let me show you this awesome point-and-shoot camera. And year after year, my friends, people that I really cared about and loved, whose shows I watched, the way people watch TV, something to be desired. Uh, the Jim Kirk's is a fine piece of work. Uh, the Ask a Ninja. I loved those shows the way people love TV. And all those people couldn't find enough money to live doing what they did unless they sucked themselves back into NBC Universal, Comcast, Ice Cream Co. and hell. So what I've been devoting my life to is helping people do both. How can you love what you love and how can you make a living doing it? And it's through everything Justin said. It's through connecting people. It's through making people matter. And what it isn't is needing 38 million people. I love PewDiePie. I, I actually watch a good deal of his shows uh, with my children, uh, which is sometimes inappropriate, but so are my children. Uh, so what I started to do is help people figure out something that Kevin Kelly wrote a blog post about a million years ago called A Thousand True Fans. Go read it. It's a million years old. It makes perfect sense. But what you need is a thousand true customers. You need a thousand people that you can serve so deeply through your mission of service to them that they're going to have the best world in the, that you, know, you could ever want. Whatever you love deeply and passionately, there is a way to make a business around it for most of you, or there's a way to make it matter if you don't need it to be a business. And so what my intention is, is to weaponize all of your brilliance and give you a way to pay your bills because it's just sad seeing all my friends not have money. And I'm not rich. I mean, my car has like five awesome dents in it. It looks like I'm an action hero. Uh, because um, um, it's the Batmobile and I drive it like that, which is fun. Um, so as I see you on your way, uh, and as you have one huge opportunity in this entire event, I will tell you the one thing that is hard to see in this room, is that the only difference between audience and community 
is which way you point the chairs. You have to look at each other. You are the superheroes and the experts. You are, even if you're not at the stage, even if you don't have a clicker, it's you who has to leave this room with a bunch of new connections. This is a no shy zone. You cannot be shy for this entire event because we're all shy, weirdo. We're all socially awkward. We all aren't sure if we bathed right, you know? You are all in a room full of people just like you who don't know the right thing to say and who make inappropriate jokes and who laugh at the wrong part. You are exactly where you should be right now. And everyone who is uh, brave enough to walk through the door, you already did better than you normally do, so give yourself credit. Get to know some people. No one here th 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 thinks they're all that in a bag of chips. I'm just like you. I pay someone to put my pants on one leg at a time, just like you do. <laughs> so I gotta send you on your way and go to all your various sessions. There are some really brilliant people here to get to know. I'm thrilled to be back. This is my third or fourth podcast. This, I was probably almost drunk. And by almost, I was probably way far past drunk. This was a night to forget. But I'm glad there were pictures all over the internet. Periscope <laughs> is not your friend. I love you very much. Have a very good day.